Welcome to the Max Future Weekly Podcast. All Apple talk and no chit chat. Okay, hey, this is Lex, and welcome to the Apple Podcast, episode 120, and today is June 30th, 2012, and I think I missed last week and uh, got kind of busy, but this is a chit-chat-free podcast all about Apple, Apple stuff, Apple news, Apple products, and uh, so I'm continuing. I'm on my 120th podcast. And you can also listen to the iPad podcast, which generally comes out on Sundays or Mondays. And I'm on track with that one, too. So thanks for listening, and you can support this by going into iTunes and giving it a positive review. Any review that's positive would be greatly appreciated. Also, check out the video portion of this podcast on YouTube or on Blip TV. So let's get to it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about was that yesterday, Friday, June 29th, was the fifth anniversary of the iPhone. Can you imagine that? The iPhone came out five years ago. And the New York Times Bits column by Brian Chen had a uh, article, the iPhone turns five, here's what it wrought. And I think it makes some good points and you know about what kind of an impact the iPhone had. And the... Um, I guess he makes two points. The first is that it changed the phone industry. He goes on to say, perhaps Steve Jobs' most significant feat was somehow persuading AT&T to let Apple design the iPhone, both its software and hardware, without even letting the carriers touch it. And he goes on to say that this was a break from old tradition in which carriers issued specific instructions to manufacturers and software makers about what would be on a phone. By asserting its authority over the iPhone, Apple was able to design a handset for the customer, not the carrier. It delivered a miniature internet-enabled computer that was extremely easy to use. So he makes a good point there. And then he goes on to say the software industry. And he says when Apple introduced its second iPhone in 2008, it opened the App Store, a digital outlet where customers could download apps to expand the capabilities of the handset. The iPhone soon became a digital Swiss army knife capable of turning into a game console, a guitar tuner, or a video editor with a few app load downloads. And he basically said it created a whole little app store economy. Now, I think these are all good points by Brian Chen, but I think he could have expanded on this, and I think he could have uh, said even more interesting stuff about it. Now, I have to say, when the uh, first iPhone came out, in uh, the original one in 2007, I didn't buy it. I I did not buy the first generation because it was too pricey. It was $500, plus it required a two-year commitment to AT&T's. And it was only a, if you remember, it wasn't a 3G iPhone. It only worked on the Edge network. It, It yet hadn't gone to the faster 3G network. So I didn't buy it. But the iPhone... Let me tell you, I think Chen should have expanded on why it was so revolutionary. Because I, you know, I had had smartphones or I had cell phones long before the iPhone. And what I didn't like is how the carriers crippled the phones and and controlled the phones. I don't know if you recall, but like, I remember, you know, what was it? The Razor, the Motorola Razor was the big hot, you know, uh, smart or uh, cell phone for a long time because it was so compact but what i couldn't stand was in terms of getting content uh, you know i was on verizon and i remember getting like an lg phone that could take pictures and i thought so cool you can take pictures with your uh, with your phone but then i rudely discovered that verizon made it that so that you couldn't really get the photos off the camera even though it had a usb connection they uh, verizon crippled it and Verizon wanted to charge me some crazy amount, like 20 cents or 10 cents a photo to, to get each photo off the phone, which was nuts. Similarly, if you wanted to play ringtones on your, um, your, your uh, phone, you know, they charged like two, three, four, five bucks for a little dippy ringtone. And forget apps, you know, whatever apps there were, you had to get through like some Verizon store. Now, what Apple did, which was revolutionary with the iPhone, wasn't only that 
it changed you know the way phones are and turning them more into computers it, but he basically sort of broke the the cell phone carriers because AT&T agreed that Apple could sell the phone and AT&T wouldn't touch any of its contents that Apple owned the contents now that was big because let's face it from the get-go the iPhone didn't have an app store. In fact, it only had a few limited apps like the iTunes or the yeah, the iTunes or the iPod app that allowed you to like sync your music and have an iPod on your phone. And frankly, that was the most revolutionary thing because you no longer had to carry an iPod. You your iPod would be in the phone. And plus you could take some pictures with it. There were some limited pictures and you could surf the internet and you had like a weather app and maybe a stock app or whatever but basically you could surf the internet you could listen to your music that was the big thing but the key was there was no like variety vari uh, AT&T you know control over its contents the only thing you saw was like a little thing that said AT&T was connected to it now this was huge because this opened the door for others to negotiate with the carriers like this and you wouldn't have like better devices if it wasn't for Apple and people forget that and people are like why did Apple like give AT&T an exclusive for like many years well that's because AT&T was the only one willing to give Apple this sort of control Apple went to Verizon and my understanding is Verizon said screw you we're not going to give you that control because the carriers are, and I can't stand the carriers, are a greedy bunch of people. And um, so Apple was able to negotiate with at and in exclusive, exclusivity. But Steve Jobs, God bless him, basically said, no, you're not going to like dictate. If you want the iPhone, you're not going to dictate the contents. And that was key and that was a really big thing. And, you know, that's changed everything in, um, you know, telephones and cell phones. And that was, you know, people really forget how trailblazing that was. But another way that the iPhone really, you know, is revolutionary and, and really changed everything is something beyond what they talked about in the bits column for the New York Times. So, yes, it opened up a whole new platform for application developers to release applications and made it much more democratic for small developers to compete with big developers and you know you could it was like a gold rush all of a sudden in 2008 when Apple introduced the App Store you know all of a sudden uh, developers were sort of creating all sorts of cool apps so that is revolutionary but I would say that the iPhone is revolutionary in this other way and I talked about this before it ushered in a new paradigm in computing and what do I mean by a new paradigm in computing and I've talked about this before let's go through the different paradigms of computing the first paradigm of computing is the ancient days of computing maybe between 1940s to the early 1970s where you had big mainframe computers you know stuffing a gigantic room th full of computers and you'd have like you know cards being run through like punch hole cards being run through the computer and you might use a standalone typewriter to type in commands to the computer but that was what the computer experience was like computers were really just for big enterprise universities or you know corporations or the defense department to use and you didn't have like computers be a personal thing and so that was the first paradigm of computers but all of that changed, I guess, in what, 1976 or so, when Apple computers started, you know, two guys. And it wasn't just Apple. There were some other, the Altair computer. Uh, Microsoft saw the Altair computer being born. And suddenly in the mid-70s, personal computing started, you know. And the first Apple computer was really the you know an inroad into personal computing and in the second Apple computer Apple II so that was the second um, coming of the the paradigm right 
but then the third paradigm was remember up till then you used to just type commands into a computer and that was a real challenge to making it easy for everyday people and so the third paradigm was the introdu introduction of the Macintosh and the windowed environment and what you see you know having graphics to make commands in other words instead of typing delete something you would um, you would just drag something into a garbage can and Microsoft copied my, uh, the Macintosh and came out with Windows on Intel chips and that you know basically this mouse and windows environment was the third paradigm of computing that made it easier for everyday people to use personal computers but it's all been windows and mice windows and mice windows and mice since ooh, about 1984 through now except the fourth paradigm came in the fourth paradigm and this is what I think the New York Times missed in the analysis is the the fourth paradigm is touch computing that you can touch use your fingers to do the computing and you know there had been attempts at touch computing before certainly Microsoft had tablets but they were like pen oriented and didn't really do very well but Apple really ushered in the era of touch computing five years ago with the iPhone and that's the big story that's the big story that the New York Times missed and doesn't really understand that the fourth paradigm is touch computing and I've said this before and iPhone is gonna usher in the fifth paradigm the fifth paradigm of computing is gonna be speech we've had dragon you know speech speech um, recognition software for what two decades but it's crappy it's shitty it doesn't work well you have to wear headphones you have to train the software and Siri is changing that Siri you just speak in natural voice you don't really need headphones you can speak in you know difficult to hear environments and so there's an arms race now and the fifth paradigm is going to be uh, speaking to your computer it's just going to be like Hal in 2001 this is going to be you know we're going to laugh at some point that we used a mouse in Windows because in about five years or so it's going to be so powerful speech computing that you're going to be talking to all sorts of things you're going to be talking to all your devices you're going to be talking to your to your um, refrigerator you're going to be saying refrigerator get a little colder refrigerator you know make me some ice refrigerator what kind of food do I have in their refrigerator and the refrigerator is going to know what kind of food you have in there because the refrigerator is going to have sensors built into it that's going to tell it what kind of food you have in there and the refrigerator you know might be Siri's sister uh, Mira and Mira is going to be like yeah you get some you've got some tomatoes you've got some hamburger you've got some raspberries you've got orange juice you've got, you've got milk you know stuff like that anyways that's gonna be the fifth paradigm and the sixth paradigm well let's see what could be the sixth paradigm of computing I guess we can have smell but that's not communicating you don't communicate with smell to to anything you just you just smell stuff so I think frankly the sixth paradigm is gonna be where we're gonna have the ability to communicate just by thinking maybe we'll have like electrodes or some sort of transmitters in our brain and we're just going to think stuff and that's going to communicate with devices and other people we're at some point there is going to be telepathy because think about it if you can articulate thoughts in your brain you know I can stop talking and thinking my brain what are you doing how are you but imagine one day there's going to be some sort of implant that's going to say we can turn your thought by thinking this way into a communication externally and that's going to be the sixth paradigm anyway the iPhone ushered in the fourth paradigm of computing uh, as as it will exist in the human race now the great tech reviewer for the Wall Street Journal Walt Mossberg to honor the um, fifth anniversary of the iPhone did something really nice he put up his five years of Walt Mossberg's iPhone reviews up on the Wall Street Journal AllThingsD.com site. 
and you can check it out. And um, he's got all five years in there. And uh, I guess it's fun reading the first review in June 27th, 2007. He writes, our verdict is that despite some flaws and feature omissions, the iPhone is of on balance a beautiful and breakthrough handheld computer. Its software especially sets a new bar for the smartphone industry and its clever finger touch interface which dispenses with the stylus and most buttons works well though it sometimes adds steps to common functions so and then he's got his other reviews um, so anyways I have a link to this on um, the show notes for the Apple 120 podcast so check it out okay so this is the Apple podcast but in some ways we have to talk about this which is Google Google had its Google I.O. event um, earlier this week, I guess like Wednesday, and Google announced some stuff that really competes with Apple. And um, I guess the, the number of things that they announced on the keynote are the following. Google announced the Nexus 7, which is a, it is a 7-inch tablet that goes for $200 and competes, I guess, mainly with the Kindle Fire. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting stuff. Let's see if I can uh, show it to you here. Nexus, Nexus 7, Nexus 7. Here we go, using the old Google. Google. So you can pre-order it, it's $199. It basically has um, six, you know, eight gigabytes of um, storage. And um, let's see the tech specs here. So it has a seven inch 1280 times 800 HD display, 216 pixels. It has a 1.2 megapixel front facing camera. So it doesn't have a back facing camera. It's only 340 gigabyte, I mean grams. So it's, I guess it's about roughly a little more than half the weight of the um, iPad. And it comes with eight gigabytes of internal storage, one gigabyte of RAM. It has a 4325 uh, mega whatever something RAM battery. It has a quad core Tegra three processor and uh, it comes with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and has a micro USB and has a, has the new Jelly Bean Android operating system, a microphone, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, a GPS, and a, an NFC. So, and it's only 200 bucks for the eight gigabyte one. You can buy the 16 gigabyte one for $249 and it ships in two to three weeks. So I'm tempted to buy this. Um, obviously it's integrated with um, Google Music, Google, Google, um, Google Books, Google Magazines, Google Movies and TVs and Google Android apps. And you can get it on Google um, Play. Now, here's the wild thing about it. Google basically confirmed that it's selling the Nexus 7 at cost. You know, so it's not making any profit. So you got to imagine, like, what kind of strategy is this? I mean, Google, I think, is freaking out, really, between Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and Facebook, I think Google is having like a, a crisis in like, you know, what's going to happen. One of the weird things is that Larry Page, the CEO, wasn't at Google I.O., nor was he at some sort of investor, um, I guess, meeting. So what's going on with him? They say he lost, he says he lost his voice, but that's a pretty big deal not to like make this major event. So, you know, in some ways, it's kind of weird what Google is doing. If it's selling this for $200, in a way, it's screwing over its um, Android partners like Samsung and um, who else? Samsung. Well, it owns Motorola.
but anybody else or HTC because how can they make a tablet that's seven inch and make a profit if um, if Google is selling selling this device at cost and Google obviously gets the operating system for free like its partners so how can anybody make any money at two hundred dollars now Amazon's doing the same thing pretty much Amazon's barely making any money maybe two dollars off of the Kindle fire so the hope is that somehow through advertising or selling content um, Google's gonna make up of the um, the fact that it's just selling these at cost I think it's kind of a crazy strategy now a disclosure I long owned Apple stock but this past Friday I bought both Microsoft stock and Google stock I had previously owned Google stock and sold it but I bought it back why did I buy it back well I'm I decided you know what look Apple's doing well but you know what Microsoft's obviously gonna is here to compete too in the tablet 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 market with its surface tablets Google's competing and has deep pockets from the um, advertising and so why not hedge maybe they can all grow and you know carve up this tablet market but this is interesting now because I what what's Apple gonna do I mean Apple now has Amazon and Google both selling seven inch tablets and what's interesting is the Google Nexus 7 at 200 bucks 8 gigabytes that's the price of an iPod touch at 8 gigabytes here let's go over to Apple and let's go to the iPod touch let me just show you uh, iPod touch look at that 199 bucks so the Nexus 7 is the same price as the iPod touch now what's Apple gonna do is Apple gonna come out with a 7 inch iPod touch that would be the killer actually if Apple came out with a 7 inch iPad touch and it could do it at 16 gigabytes for 250 bucks and then keep the regular iPod touch at let's say 175 bucks and that would just destroy um, destroy Amazon and Google so I bet you I think Apple is definitely going to come out with a 7 inch tablet uh, at some point um, I would say in the next 8 months you're going to see a 7 inch tablet from Apple just because you know I think people want a lighter easier to carry carry device somewhere between the size of an iPod touch and the iPad I mean I like the retina display on the third generation iPad but I'm a little annoyed that it's heavier than the second generation iPad because yeah I mean it's great having all that great retina display but portability is something too so this is definitely gonna put the heat the heat on the heat on Apple to come out with a 7 inch I think okay so the craziest thing that I think uh, Google announced at Google I.O. is something called the Nexus Q and I think I think they're really panicking over there at Google because of Apple's sort of juggernaut with uh, AirPlay and the Apple TV so they came out with this r device that's about the size of a grapefruit called the Nexus Q and they're selling it for three hundred dollars which is nuts and it's a 25 watt amplifier but basically the only way you can use this thing is if you have an Android device and you can stream music and movies I guess from your devices through the Nexus Q and the idea is that the Nexus Q would then be hooked up to your TV and on um, on uh, Google's website they have like these sh you know slide shots it's cycling through showing this like round ball Nexus Q hooked up to a TV uh, or an amplifier and it acts as a 
pass through, sort of like the Apple TV. But the thing is about the Apple TV is the Apple TV is really small. You know, it's very small, compact, and you don't need like a, another device to run it. You can operate it through just a clicker. But the Nexus Q, you've, you have to buy uh, an Android device to control it. So I think they're nuts because unless you're just incredibly obsessed with Google products, you're going to buy either the Roku, which is like the Apple TV, very cheap. I think the Roku is like 60 bucks or something like that. Or you're going to buy the Apple TV for 99 bucks. So this thing's an amplifier, but it's only 25 watts. So, I mean, are you really going to, you know, you going to really get it? So let's look at the tech specs for the Nexus Q. It's got an Ethernet port, a Toslink optical audio uh, port out. So if you want audio, uh, audio out, it's got a micro HDMI port and a micro USB port and banana jack speaker outputs so oh i guess you can um you've got like little jacks you can connect it to speakers so it's a 25 watt um it's got 25 no 12 and a half watt per channel yeah 25 watt amplifier so i guess you could hook it up to some speakers so i guess it can't make noise on its own you've got to like hook it up to speakers and um, it weighs two pounds, has a 4.6 inch diameter, and hardware controls. Oh, I see. You can control the volume by rotating the top dome and cap capacitive touch sensor for mute. But how do you... It doesn't play content unless you stream stuff through an Android device. So, I don't know. I, I think this is like the dumbest thing Google has done in a long time. They just don't understand how to make hardware. Here's a gallery if you're looking at the video version of this. It's like, it looks like a bowling ball. It looks like a candle pin bowling ball. And um, what kind of accessories? You've got speaker cables. How much do they sell those for? The, ski the speaker cables are 50 bucks. So add another 50 bucks to the 300 bucks if you want to have sp speaker cables that work with this sucker. And if you want some bookshelf speakers, throw in another 700 bucks. I mean, another 400 bucks. So 400 bucks for the speakers, 50 bucks, 450, 750 bucks if you get all of this stuff like a speaker and it doesn't work on its own you got to get an android phone so you got to spend like a thousand dollars to get the speaker the nexus q all this stuff um i think google's a little crazy frankly okay so the other thing that um google really announced on the first day of google io which much fanfare by sergey britton one of the founders is um, that Google Go Google Glasses, you know, this sort of weird little cyborg glasses that you put on your eyes that allow you to record video and get certain sort of data. It's going to be made available for developers for $1,500. And this was announced with much fanfare by Sergey. He had some people skydive wearing Google Glasses and landing on the Moscone Center and then coming to the... Um, stage and um, they made a big deal about this and look you know I have to give Google credit for being ambitious with technology you know they have the Google car and um, they want to push technology it's just you know these are guys who made their fortune by coming up with an algorithm and a search engine to search the internet and then sell advertising and they haven't really proven that they know how to make hardware consumer products for people that make money for Google and I do think that eventually we're going to have things like Google glasses you know but I don't think 
the technology is there yet. I mean, you got to get the price down. And right now it looks goofy. If you look at this Google Glasses, it goes over like one eye and it makes you look like one of the wacky Android cyborg uh, people in like, you know, like these science fiction movies. And that's going to, you know, they're kind of ugly. And um, I think I think we're going to have other sort of computer paradigm changes before we get into something like the Google Glasses. So, you know, it's like kind of a weird thing that they announced. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be ordering one. Okay, so the other things that Google announced do affect Apple. And that is on the second day of Google iOS, Google announced a couple of software things that affect Apple. One is that Google released Chrome for iOS, um, and it's become, according to Computer World, the n top spot on the app market for the free apps on the iPhone. So it's a, basically Chrome is the browser. And I got to tell you, I'm not... A lot of people love it. A lot of people are giving it kudos, but to me, it's not so great. It's not so great for the following reasons. One, it's not that fast. Apparently, Apple doesn't allow other browsers on the iOS to get, you know, the full version of what Apple uses for its Safari browser. So they get a form of WebKit, uh, whatever. I don't know all the technical stuff, but it doesn't run as zippy as Safari. But also, they've sort of reimagined what the, you know, what the tabs are like on the browser and the bookmarks and the syncing. And if you have a Google Chrome on your computers, it will sync the bookmarks. But it's kind of goofy. Like, the bookmarks are not like the traditional bookmarks on Safari or on, on, a, on a computer or on the iPad. And it's more like, hey, let me see what the bookmarks are on your computer. But I'd like the bookmarks to just automatically be synced with my Chrome browser and to have it all like in other words it's just one set of bookmarks across all devices and instead it's like hey here are the bookmarks that are on your MacBook Air here are the bookmarks that are on your iMac so I'm not too thrilled with it I don't find it to be much of a, an improvement and I, it's a definitely a different design than um, than Safari on the iPhone and iPad but, uh, you know, it's free. So clearly, Google, you know, is trying to stay relevant in iOS, even though Apple's booting Google as, you know, the def default map service from iOS 6. And I guess, I guess Apple will let the Chrome browser stay on the iPhone and iPad. Maybe they have, maybe Apple is worried about antitrust concerns if it kicks it out, although... On the iPhone, Apple doesn't have more than 50% of the smartphone market. So I don't know why they would be concerned. But anyways, you know, Google launched Google Chrome for both um, the iPad and the iPhone. Okay, so the other thing that um, Google, I guess, updated was Google Drive. Uh, or launched was Google Drive for the iPhone and iPad. And, you know, Google Drive is that Dropbox competitor, gives you five gigabytes for free. And now there's an app. And uh, let's see, it, um, it lets you create, share, and collaborate and keep all your stuff in one place, it says here in the iTunes stores. Quickly share a photo with a friend 1,000 miles away. Read the most up-to-date version of your document, whether you're at home, at the office, or on the go. Make items available offline so you can view them while you're on a plane. Now, eventually, like you can see your documents, you know, um, Google, whatever, Google Office, Google Docs is available in Google Drive now. I mean, that's what Google's doing is pushing Google Docs on the Google Drive. And eventually, you'll be able to edit your documents in Google Drive, but they haven't turned that on yet. I think they're going to turn that on soon. So 
they did update it to version 1.01. It says features quick, quickly and easily access and view your documents, photos, and videos anywhere. Make files available offline so you can view them even when you don't have internet connection. Uh, easily share files with collaborators on the go. Sync files across your desktop and all your devices. Open files from Drive with other apps installed on your device. Star your important files. So the other thing that I read is that Google's going to make Google Docs able to work offline. So you're going to be able to go into your settings with Google Docs and say you want to work offline, which should be interesting because it might be an alternative way to use documents on your Macintosh and hopefully it'll eventually work on your iPad. So Google, you know, Google's trying to stay very relevant in iOS. And so we'll have to see. Now, Google said that it's going to finally update and come out and revamp its Google Plus app. Right now, it's just a, an iPhone app that works on your iPad. But apparently, Google will soon up, up, upgrade and make um, Google Plus a great, um, tablet app on the iPad. So that, that should be interesting. Well, um, this was also a very big week between Apple and Google in the courts because Apple earlier in the week won a, an injunction that stops the sale of the Samsung Cal Galaxy Tab. And this was before Judge Lucy Coe in the United States District Court. This came out just about like the time of Google I.O. on June 27. It said Apple wanted an injunction, this is in the Washington Post, uh, against Samsung's 10-inch Galaxy Tab in California Federal Court Tuesday after a judge ruled that Apple had made a strong claim that the Samsung tablet had improperly co copied the design of the iPad. And, um, um, you know, this was a big blow. Now, the thing is, that Galaxy Tab came out earlier and is not the latest tablet from Samsung. Samsung la uh, launched the Galaxy S3, and um, Apple is expected to seek to block that from being sold and get an injunction against that. Um, it says, as for the Galaxy Tab 10, stores will be able to sell their current stock Fortune reported the decision has no bearing on sales of the Galaxy Tab 10 2 version 2, uh, which was designed to circumvent a patent related ban in Germany. So that was a big victory for Apple, um, getting a preliminary injunction against Samsung's Galaxy Tab. But guess what? Things got more interesting as the week went along. So on June 29th, the fifth anniversary of the iPhone, Apple won a second preliminary injunction against Samsung before Judge Lucy Coe in the United States District Court in San Jose, California, in joining the Galaxy Nexus phone, which is Google's flagship Android phone that it sells on its website, which is made by um, made by um, Samsung, and this was a huge blow, and people went crazy about this. And um, you know, I read the decision, and it's very interesting um, what why the court entered in this preliminary injunction. So. Judge Coe issued a very lengthy decision granting the preliminary injunction against the Nexus. And basically, Apple was basically saying that the Nexus violates several patents, uh, including slide to unlock. But I think it was the patent. So there were four patents at issue. And basically, Apple has to show that it will prevail on the patents and that it will suffer irreparable harm unless it gets a preliminary injunction uh, to prevent the sale. And for irreparable harm, it basically showed that, you know, that it, um, you know, it would lose market share to Amazon, I mean, to Samsung. 
Now, what's interesting is I think the patent that Apple won on is this patent that um, allows, it's a patent that, you know, it's the search patent. The, the, you know, how like in the iPhone you can search for um, content that's both web content and also anything on your I iPhone. And I guess it's called like heuristic, heuristic um, algorithm. So the battle was over really that. And apparently Apple has this search uh, patent for like how you search on an iPhone. And I guess also using Siri. Now this is a huge thing because you have to imagine that a lot of devices are going to want to copy Apple with that search function. Which is that you sort of, you know, you go to the search area and you get apps, you get emails, you get anything. And um, let's see if I can find Judge Co. Uh, describing the patent. Um, well, infringement. Let's see. Um, oh, here we go. This, I highlighted this in the decision. In one preferred embodiment, the 604 system, this is the patent at issue from Apple, relies on a retrieval manager component that receives search terms from the user either in the form of text or speech and dispatches that input to a plurality of plug-in modules. Then there's a site. Each of these modules has an associated heuristic search algorithm which the mod module employs to locate information within the module's respective area of search that, that is responsive to the user's input. For instance, one module may be configured to search the titles of local documents that pertain to the search terms. Another module might be confi configured to index and search the contents of locally stored files for relevant matches. A third module may search a list of the most recently assessed files, applications, and websites. A fourth module might employ a search engine to locate internet web pages whose content matches the user's search terms. The results from the modules are returned to the retrieval manager, which in turn presents the results to the user, potentially after employing an additional heuristic to determine which results are more, more, most relevant. The 604 system enables searching to occur on portions of the user's input as they are received, potentially returning relevant results from the user be before the user has entered the complete search terms. And so this is, I think, the main patent that Apple's really complained about in one injunction. It says Apple accuses Samsung's gallery, Galaxy Nexus phones of infringing claims 6 and 19 of the 604 patent by enabling a user to perform searches across multiple information sources using a variety of heuristic algorithms with a single interface. The accused feature in the Galaxy Nexus is the Google Quick Search Box. Uh, and it goes on to describe that. So here's what's fascinating. Wouldn't this be, isn't this amazing? Google's known for search and Apple has some sort of heuristic search thing going on the iPhone that it's patent that it can beat up Google with and Google is supposedly the king of search. So I think what this must be such a blow to Google. Um, you know it goes on to talk about I guess slide to unlock but I think it's mainly this search Siri search and text search um, function I, that is powerful. But the thing is, if Apple can get a preliminary junction on on this, who's to say it's going to stop it from getting an injunction on other Android phones? Now, Apple has to post $95 million um, to get the preliminary injunction in, in force because the way it works is... Um, you know, while the preliminary injunction is going, if, if Samsung is damaged by the injunction and later on prevails at trial, 
the money's there to compensate Samsung for having, you know, a preliminary injunction that wasn't the basis of, um, you know, there was no basis for. Now, what's interesting is large parts of the um, order are redacted. So po there's potentially confidential trade secrets that the court agreed to let the parties redact. For example, on this pa on this section licensing practices, you know, it starts off Samsung also argues that Apple's licensing practices show that Apple could be compensated with money damages for any alleged infringement. Then it goes on to say Samsung's only evidence with regard to and then big big um, redact so you don't know what is said there and then it goes on to say thus the court finds this license in opposite to the question of irreparable harm then some more redaction so some of this stuff is secret because I guess the court was convinced that there's trade secrets but this is a huge huge victory for Apple and it's got to freak out totally freak out Google and other um, you know people who use Android now on Google Plus where I hang out people were people were going crazy I mean t clearly Google Plus has a lot of hardcore Android supporters and and they really um, they were just freaking out and very hostile to Apple and I don't think they really understand um, understand you know hey th th there's a patent laws and Google's a big corporation and Samsung's a big corporation and they clearly have lawyers who know the patent rules and they know the risks of copying you know other companies and a lot of people seem don't seem to understand they think that Apple should not be able to get patents for things like you know the heuristic search and um, you know the design and all that thing and people you know are just going crazy I'll give you an example like I'm looking on the Verge's announcement on Google Plus and uh, one person writes good thing I already bought one this is um, the Galaxy Nexus also that's absolutely ridiculous and F Apple I better still get Google now F Apple another person writes over universal search patent Apple I despise you um, and then somebody writes, somebody should seriously sue the patent office. Very sad. Um, somebody writes, Apple, you will be the next rim. And then um, somebody writes, really, Apple, get over yourself. And, you know, I just, it kind of, I just, you know, I don't really get it. Like this anger towards Apple, you know. I mean, people forget. And I think it's so poetic that, that Apple got this injunction on the fifth anniversary of the iPhone because, you know, folks, go back and look at what phones and smartphones existed before the iPhone. None of them looked anything like the iPhone. The iPhone totally revolutionized the look and feel of smartphones, and Samsung together with Android, has been slave, you know, just copying the look and feel of, of an iPhone. I mean, before the iPhone was out, nothing looked like it. There was nothing like that. So everybody who says that, there are all these people who say that, oh, you know, the iPhone's touch interface is intuitive and natural, and, and you can't patent that. Well, if it's so natural, how come nobody had done it before? How come nobody... How come Microsoft or Google hadn't come out with the Android phones or the Windows 7 phones long before Apple? Apple's the one who pioneered it. Yes, there was the idea of touch concept and all that, but Apple put it all together. And, you know, and remember, Steve Jobs was so upset at Eric Schmidt and Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who were the, his partners, because, you know, the, Google was on the board of Apple and then Apple comes out with the iPhone, and then Google suddenly comes out with this Android operating system, gives it away for free. You know, it's like your partner is basically screwing you over. And Steve Jobs told Walter Isaacson that, you know, he's going to go thermo thermal nuclear war on Android because it's wrong and that he was ripped off. And I think he felt that to his dying day that, that Sergey and um, Larry Page ripped him off and that Eric Schmidt 
ripped him off. And that's what these lawsuits are about. And um, it's a big, big, big loss for Google and for Samsung having the Galaxy Nexus preliminarily enjoined. And, you know, the way, you know, if Google really wants to innovate, it should come out with something completely different than the, uh, you know, the look and feel of iOS or the look and feel of iPhone. So, you know, it's been quite an emotional week. Well, this seems to be the old Google Apple show because uh, another piece of bad news came out for um, for uh, Google on June 29th, that, as reported in CNET, and that is that the FTC is investigating Google over Motorola patents. Now, you see, Apple has a lot of ammunition against Google and Motorola and Samsung regarding you know the patent violations, the design violations, and Motorola sort of not having a lot to fight back with is tapped into what are known as its FRAND patents. Now, FRAND patents are patents that have to be fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. And they cover technology essential to the smooth operation of an industry. So, for example, when cell phones were first created, you know, um, somebody created like a, a standard, right, for 3G connectivity. And Motorola was one of those, you know, companies that did so. And to get everybody to use the same standard, Motorola agrees that it will license its um, patents under a France standard, which is fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. In other words, you know, not charging too much. And and the reason is, if if you don't make that pledge, nobody's going to adopt that technology as the standard. So you can't make that pledge and have everybody adopt that as the standard and then turn around and start, you know, squeezing people for money for it. So Google, so Motorola, which was acquired by Google to defend itself against the lawsuits from Apple on and Apple basically didn't use FRAND patents to sue Motorola or Samsung. Apple used non-FRAND patents. In other words, patents for things that are not essential to a technology in the industry. And Motorola overseas and also in the U.S., you know, it didn't have much in its sort of patent weapon, so it tapped into the FRAND patents, as did Samsung. Well, in Europe, they're very upset about that because you can't make something be a standard and then turn around and say, we're going to rip you off and charge a lot of money. So apparently the United States government is investigating this. It says here the Federal Trade Commission is investigating whether Google's Motorola Mobility Unit is improperly blocking access to industry standard technology that should be licensed to competitors according to traditional industry and legal practice. A source says Google has been served by the FTC with a civil investigative demand similar to a subpoena. The news was reported earlier by Bloomberg. This is on the 27th of June, which said the government is also seeking information from Apple and Microsoft. The issue involves so-called FRAND patents, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory that cover technology essential to the smooth operation of an industry. So... I don't know. This has not been a good week for Google. And it's kind of weird because I did buy Google's stock. So, you know, we'll have to see what happens. But I think it's been a kind of tough week for Google. Okay, so a little bit of sad news for Apple. Um, one of its major executives announced that he's retiring. And that's Bob Mansfield. He's sort of the heavy set guy who's in charge of the hardware for Apple. Uh, I guess he oversees the hardware for the Macintosh as well as the iPhone and iPod since 2010. And apparently he's retiring. It says here in ZDNet um, he's the senior vice president and he's retiring. And Dan Riccio, and he, I've seen him at some, he did make some presentations at some of the Apple events. And he seemed like a jolly guy. And obviously he's leaving with a lot of money. Um, and 
I bet you they they're deep in talent there, and so, you know, he'll be missed. But, you know, I'm sure Apple has people working there who are very familiar with the hardware and know what to do. Okay, so one of the exciting things this week is that Apple launched a, a podcast app for free for both the you know that works on the iPhone and the iPad. And um, the cool thing about it is that um, it's got a very cool animation in it that looks like an old reel-to-reel tape recorder. And I did a little review of it, and um, you know I think it's um, it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool um, pretty cool you know application. And why is Apple doing it? Um, I think Apple's doing it because I think eventually it's going to separate out uh, a lot of the features in iTunes into separate apps. I mean, Apple has already done that on iOS with the iTunes University app. Uh, Also, remember, the music app is separate from iTunes. So unlike on the Mac where you play your music in iTunes on iOS for the longest time, you've had a separate music app separate from iTunes. And now podcasts are going to get their own uh, app. And um, now what's interesting is some people think that there's a feature in there that indicates that maybe Apple will allow people to pay for or or pay for subscriptions to podcasts and help uh, podcasters monetize podcasts. Now, as someone who podcasts himself, like me, that would be kind of cool. It would be kind of cool if Apple, for example, you know, Apple could inject ads if you wanted to into a podcast and help sell ads and maybe split the ads, you know, whatever fees are earned from the ads with the podcaster. You know, because a lot of people are still going to want to have free podcasts. So I'm kind of excited by this. I think it does make sense for Apple to have its own podcast app. And uh, I did a review of it, which is on the Max Future YouTube channel. You can check it out. And, um, you know, we'll have to see how Apple develops this podcast app. Now, TUAW.com had an interesting story on June 29th. It appears that Apple keeps uh, changing the algorithms in the App Store. And apparently they changed it a couple of times. Now, according to Kelly Hodgkin's article, it says here, Apple tinkered with its App Store algorithm last week and changed the search position of some apps by ordering results based on user ratings and an app's description. And I guess uh, TechCrunch reported this. Uh, So they've tweaked the algorithm again to add some weight back to the app's name and keyword. And it says the change was detected by uh, Tomas Kolinko, and and he's a developer and a founder of the App Store analyst company AppCode.es. And um, so you know it makes sense that they're going to tweak the App Store because you know there are some developers who probably try to game the App Store, and just like Google tweaks the search function on Google search to fool, you know, those who try to game the system. I bet you Apple tweaks the algorithm for the App Store to prevent people from gaming the system. Now, the Apple TV could be coming closer and closer to looking like an iPhone or an iPad. And a website called amog.com has an article on June 28th. Apparently, you know, Apple released a beta of iOS 6 for the Apple TV. And uh, someone, I guess, in Brazil playing around with it discovered that you can rearrange the order of the icons on the Apple TV in the iOS 6 beta. And apparently you do it using the clicker you hold down and it gives that sort of wiggle that you do when you get it on the iPhone or the iPad you know, you have the grid layout. And um, so it could be that in the future, you'll be able to customize the icon grid on the Apple TV. Uh, And apparently in the iOS 6 Beta 2, you can sort of do this now if you're a developer. 
So pretty cool. You know, I do think one day you'll be able to have apps that work on your Apple TV together with your iPhone and iPad. Okay, so that's it for episode 120 of the Apple Podcast. This is Lex at MaxFuture.com. Thanks for listening. Any positive review in any iTunes store would be greatly appreciated. Also in the new podcast app that's on iOS, if you can get it and uh, find the Apple Podcast, that would be appreciated. Also go to YouTube and check out the video version of this under the Max Future channel. So thanks for listening and I guess... See you next week. This has been a Max Future Production.